As a teenager, Satan tempted me into dabbling in exotic Eastern mysticism and developing psychic powers, which hooked me into the New Age. This path led over the course of 15 years a life involving yoga, psychedelic drugs, holistic health, belief in reincarnation, acquiring familiar spirits, divination, crystal power, and many other New Age phenomena. In fact, through the years, I rose quickly through the ranks of the New Age to write two popular books by a respected mainstream publisher, which sparked a meteoric career ascent to national and international renown on the New Age scene. But in the midst of enjoying all this success, I had an absolutely horrifying encounter with evil forces, evil forces that masquerade as light and offer counterfeit truths through broad New Age paths. While I'll elaborate on this whole story later on in this talk, these demonic forces threatened to totally possess and devour me. And on the brink of seeming annihilation, I came to repent of many multitudes of sins and to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior. One of the major themes I'd like to point out tonight is the rather alarming growth rate of this movement and how it has spread extensively throughout every level of our society in both obvious and well-disguised ways. The New Age movement has gone from being a hippie and Eastern guru revival of the 1960s to being sparked in grassroots middle America in the 1970s, to being one of the fastest rising phenomena in our country in the 1980s. Findings of numerous highly respected researchers conclude that the New Age is the fastest growing alternative belief system in our country today. With the advent of what I call the Shirley MacLaine era, starting in 1985 or so, the American general public has been exposed to at least a very general picture of the New Age agenda. As a society, we've become geared to basing our beliefs on our experiences. If our experience and our feelings tell us that something is valid and genuine and good, then we automatically assume that that is the measure of absolute truth. Far from being benevolent, as is often portrayed with many occult manifestations, it has been seen to be highly deceptive and without any solid foundation on which to test these experiences. Joanna Michelson in her book, The Beautiful Side of Evil, tells how society is embracing wholeheartedly the occult. Television talk show hosts are falling over one another to get the latest psychic wonder to appear for an interview. From Casper the Ghost to cartoons of Space Age Marvels, children are being taught to accept supernatural phenomena as a wonderful part of their everyday life to be joyfully and fearlessly embraced. She also stated, Ouija boards are sold in almost every toy store, frequently next to Dungeons and Dragons, a game which is a cult to the core, whatever its devotees may believe. When my parents and I returned to the West in the 60s, uh, Hinduism had somehow been repackaged and was now being sung about by the Beatles um, there were West End shows in London, the hair, that were lifting up yoga, meditation, vegetarianism. Hare Krishna converts were going down the streets of Oxford Street in London singing about a Hinduism that I hadn't seen as a child growing up. Are there indeed spiritual forces guiding these changes in our society? Have we misunderstood the nature of the conspiracy? I think we would be very naive if we thought there wasn't a um, intentional purpose behind desensitizing all of us into a worldview that is opposed to what our designer intended for us to think. Now it could be a deception on various levels. Uh, it's certainly intentional from a spiritual point of view because we know who the enemy of God is and that is Satan himself who wants very much for man to uh, stay away from the uh, power that has been given to man in his communication and fellowship with God. And Satan wants to take that for himself. He wants to be able to control and um, keep man in bondage so that he can possess him uh, physically on earth and eternally uh, in hell. Is it as many believe only a global police state or has its spiritual implications that overarch all of its outward, overt signs of change. And I would say that if I'm right, then we're all chasing the wrong thing. If I'm right, then the real new world order is, is winning and we are losing. Um, if I'm right, then we are all getting sucked into it and we, we don't really understand what they are wanting to do with getting everybody to believe that an evolution is coming. We haven't pieced that together. We've never even considered that what, what 
gonna, what that agenda could look like or what, why would they would be pushing it. So. Uh, of this one world order and the new world religion. And that has been, this idea has been around for 6,000 years, ever since the Garden of Eden. What is so interesting in this whole incredible plan is coming to its culmination at the present time. When one day the earth wakes up, the world wakes up, and all these beings are going to appear again. V, we have it on the television. Five, you know, it, even the Vatican are telling us now that there are benign beings out there, but we're not to be afraid of them. They were created by the same God that created us. NASA is telling us they're trying to contact extraterrestrial beings. Everybody is at it. Most of the countries have opened up all their UFO uh, um, secret files and, and are revealing to the world, yes, we see all these UFOs. So between UFOs, uh, alien abductees, alien contacts, all the movies, TV programs and books that are prevalent today are all preparing subliminally. People don't even realize that, but they're being conditioned for the reappearance of these beings on earth in plain sight of man once again, as it was, so shall it be. In Ephesians 6.12 we read, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But if the conspiracy is spiritual in nature, as the Bible states, where is it leading? Who is influencing the New Age movement of today? And what, if anything, is dangerous about this trend? Things that alarm me enough to actually drop seven years from my law practice and sound alarms on the New Age movement because I looked at it and I said, my God, this is the stuff of which Nazism was made. We can prove that Lester Crowley has been more influential on Western culture, popular culture, than any other human being. Now, that's quite incredible because he's also the most highly regarded Satanist. And a Satanist he was. Some uh, New Agers and some Satanists want to try to distance himself, distance Crowley from being a real Satanist. However, he makes it really clear. Uh, we have quote after quote after quote who he was serving and how he was serving his god Satan. In fact, he did rituals that make it quite clear. He would grab a frog in one of his rituals and he would uh, say, you know, hail under the power of Satan. I have you, Jesus of Nazareth, to the frog. And then he would crucify this frog and speaking in the, in the terms as though he was Satan and treating this frog as though he was Jesus. This was just one of his many satanic rituals. He was a very, very evil man. He was kicked out of France and called the evilest man in the world, or the wickedest man on earth by uh, the popular newspapers of his day. He talked about sacrificing several children to Satan. Uh, he, he talked about bringing in the New World Order under the coming Antichrist. So it's very pertinent to understand that many of these musicians that lined up after him were all about anarchy and rebellion against established uh, government and with the idea of bringing in a new world government. Uh. This is Edward Alexander Crowley, also known as Aleister Crowley. He styled himself the wickedest man in the world. He believed himself to be the great beast and he changed his name to Aleister Crowley so he it would add up in both English, Hebrew, and Greek Kabbalah as 666. In 1904, Crowley had a communication with an extraterrestrial being named Ewas. And this being, through his wife, <clears throat> kind of a channeling type operation, excuse me, brought forth a book that was called the Book of the Law in 1904. And this book declared that the slain and risen God, i.e. Jesus, had stepped off the throne and that a new God, the crown and conquering child, was taking his place. And as a result of this, Crowley proclaimed the end of Christianity and the start of Crowleyanity. Obviously, the guy had no self-esteem problems. Uh, in fact, he was a brilliant genius. He could play eight chess games blindfolded. He was an accomplished poet, mountaineer, painter, writer. He had so many Masonic degrees that you could fill up five pages of a book with them. This guy was probably the most highly honored Mason in the world. And he was also the most dangerous man of the 20th century. And he began doing rituals to bring forth this crowned and conquering child.
One of the most notorious figures of the 20th century is that of occultist Aleister Crowley, an incredibly complex figure who has been both defended and feared. As Crowley disciple Robert Anton Wilson commented, there is no sense in trying to whitewash Crowley's reputation. Alistair spent most of his life systematically blackening it. Alistair Crowley seemed to know from an early age that he was to serve his god, Satan. Before I touched my teens, I was already aware that I was the beast, whose number is 666. I did not understand in the least what that implied. In my third year at Cambridge, I devoted myself consciously to the great work, understanding thereby the work of becoming a spiritual being, free from the constraints, accidents, and deceptions of material existence. As a child, while reading the book of Revelation, rather than identifying with the Lamb Jesus, he identified with the beast. The following account is written by Crowley in the third person. He liked to imagine himself in agony. In particular, he liked to identify himself with the beast, whose number is the number of a man, 603 score and 6. Also, he would write in confessions, echoing another theme from the Bible, man's original sin. My eyes were opened. I had become as a god, knowing good and evil. Probably the most significant book produced by Crowley was the Book of the Law, written in 1904. It was from this book that we get the popular saying of, Do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law, which became, Do your own thing, of the 1960s. The book describes the establishment of Crowley's new eon. Crowley biographer Lauren Sutton describes, in short, the old eon, of the dying God, of man preoccupied by his sins and morality, must be avenged by the new eon, in which humanity recognizes its own innate divine spirit. The transformation from the old eon to new must be total. Fire, blood and blasphemy are prominent amongst the birth pangs. There will be ecstatic realizations for the worthy Thelemite. It is by the teachings of Horus that the readers of the book must expect to live and die. I mean, it's all about peace and love on the outside, but when it all comes down, there's going to be a brutal leader that will emerge, who Crowley uh, was forthright enough to talk about in his in his books and talk about this bloodbath that would come, when Christians would be put to death and. While Crowley taught a type of love. It would seem that this does not extend to Christians. Nature's way is to weed out the weak. This is the most merciful way to. At present, all the strong are being damaged and their progress hindered by the dead weight of the weak limbs and the missing limbs, the diseased limbs and the atrophied limbs, the Christians to the lions. A humanitarianism, which is the simplest of the mind, acts on the basis of the lie the king must die. The king is beyond death. It is merely a pool where he dips for refreshment. We must therefore go back to Spartan ideas of education. And the worst enemies of humanity are those who wish, under pretext of compassion, to continue its ills through the generations, the Christians to the lions.